Hi everyone, um, I'm Danielle, chair <laughs> of the Gene Reading and Careers Committee, and I just wanted to uh, let you know that we are sponsoring this talk. I'm so glad that so many of you are here. Uh, this this is the talk of the town. One minute, please, the bottom. Get super excited, but um, so I am going to pass it over to Anthony Perillo, and he's going to tell you all. So much, Danielle. All right. No, I'm with that said in the mall. I can actually hear you. Uh, uh, all right. Well, welcome to On the Hot Seat. This is the APLS panel with hot questions and even hotter wings. Uh, <laughs> um, so, so it's really, we have, we have a panel here of forensic and legal professionals who are going to share with you the ins and outs of speaking out as an expert, whether it's in court, legislative meetings, in the media, just basically using the knowledge that we have to inform outside of our traditional academic or even the traditional uh, psycho-legal world. And we're hoping for a lot of you, regardless of your level of experience or familiarity with extra work, if you're pondering it, the idea here is to get informed, get prepared, and hopefully get inspired to use the MSR team that you all have and will continue to develop to contribute it outside of the traditional means that we tend to do in our education and early on in our career. Uh, this is a CD sponsored um, web uh, camel and you can get CD credits. I've been told to give you the pasto for it, which is over there too. Make note of the word Chicago if you want CD credits. And apparently you're gonna have to enter that word if you want CD credits to, for this panel in particular. Now, the of course, this channel also has a spicy twist to it. Uh, how many? How many of you are familiar with the show Hogwarts? Maybe. Oh, wow. <laughs> okay. So for for those of you that are are not familiar, this is Hogwarts is a YouTube series um, where somebody interviews celebrities and asks them a series of questions. And right before each question, they eat a uh, progressively spicy we wings with progressively spicier hot sauces. We have a clip um, from Shaquille O'Neal's reaction. <laughs> uh, what the villain has been, what this can be like. Kansas. Oh, I apologize, Kansas. Oh. It's time to reach for that jug. You lied to me. You oh! Oh, guess what got me? God. All right, Shaq. Oh, you fire. Shaq did oh. fool. It's <laughs> undeniable. One of the great TV you said it wasn't high. era. But with the proliferation of the internet and camera phones, there's so mean. much more than what's just on the NBA, on Is TNT, this or ESPN. So that's what we're going to be doing. <laughs> I was not shown that clip before I agreed to participate. <laughs> <laughs> just want to make that clear. Can you really think I didn't see credit for this? <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> so we will, we will be asking, a, I'll be asking a series of questions uh, to our panel before each one. We will eat a wing with progressively spicier sauces. The slides will uh, include the gist of the questions that we'll be asking, as well as just for the FYI there, the hot sauce that we're trying this. For those of you that are familiar with the show, yes, the bomb is in up here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we were going to, we hope to leave a little bit of room at the end for, for questions from the audience. There will be no hot sauce portion for that. So can you, and it's, you don't have to have any warm hot sauce if you respond to those questions as well. Um, so let's, let's go ahead and get started with just some brief introductions to who is here uh, before we, before we get on with the specific questions. Um, so, so I am Anthony Carrillo. Um, in my, I'm a forensic training director. I moderate the University of New Mexico's Law and Health series each week uh, to go over various views and issues in forensic psychology. Uh, I also, as training director, uh, prep postdoctoral fellows in expert testimony, uh, including including actual uh, simulated expert testimony experiences or the cases that they're involved in. I've appeared in a couple of uh, media podcast episodes and thinking about the different dynamics of how you communicate um, outside of the classroom there too. Um, the rest of these intro slides, oh, and, and spice level too. Um, I, I like spicy food. I tend to sweat out of the top of my 
head is <laughs> I said it's about a 75% chance I get some aggressive hiccups near the one. Uh, 25% chance doesn't happen, but we'll see. Um, and then the rest of these go in uh, alphabetical order by last name. So if you want to briefly introduce yourselves and your spice tolerance starting with April. Hi, everyone. I'm April Alexander. I'm currently the Metro Lina Distinguished Scholar in Health and Public Policy at UNC Charlotte. Uh, what I bring to the table today is talking about my advocacy engagement and legislative testimony and also public impact scholarship through media. I've um, been featured in New York Times, USA Today, NBC Nightly News, and just bringing psychological science to the public. Um, I thought I liked spicy foods until today. <laughs> All right, and then he. Is this where he? It's, uh, I'm Heath Hodges. Um, I primarily a private practitioner. I do most of my testimony is as an expert with criminal adult matters. Uh, more recently, I I kind of depositions for uh, civil personal injury type issues. Um, I've also done some log trials. What else do I have on here? Oh, for reason consultation. So I've been an editor for attorneys who hired me to evaluate someone else's evaluation and uh, scrutinize it and sometimes shred it. And this, and um. Oh, yeah, then I have a book series with Rick Frederick, uh, Risen for Attorneys, about how to do that kind of thing, to test unfavorable mixed health evaluations. Uh, my spice level tolerance is arguably even higher when I was younger. I'm beginning to realize that I am Asian rapidly. <laughs> my body does not have the tolerance that my palate does. And so if you see me after this show, my field position, Monique, you may have something to do with your wings. <laughs> Try to Speaking of that aging part, uh, thank you to APLS for rescheduling this from its uh, original 9.30 a.m. Got to be good. It's supposed to ruin the entire day and absolutely early enough that I think I might be able to fall asleep. <laughs> All right, Jeff. Hi, everyone. I'm uh, Jeff Kukuka. If you were just at the plenary session, you heard me talk a whole lot about forensic science um, because that is my niche is cognitive bias and, and error in forensic science settings. Uh, I testify on that topic in court quite a bit. Um, I think I've worked in 14 or 15 U.S. states now, the U.K., D.C., and so on. I'm talking about those issues. I also serve on the OSAC Human Factors Test Group, helping to crack standards. I'm working on the Verland uh, Medical Examiner's Audit, which you also heard about in the plenary session. Um, I've testified a bunch of times before the Maryland General Assembly in support of various uh, criminal justice-related bills. I love doing op-eds, podcasts, talking with journalists, that sort of thing. Even got to consult on an episode of uh, last week's Life with John Oliver once, which was really, really cold. Um, I love Spicy Moon. I've actually done this a couple of times before because I'm kind of a masochist. Um, I've done it with Anthony, actually. Um, but I still didn't want to give myself a five because I didn't want to look cocky and just to taste things. <laughs> So I signed up for the content and not the spice. <laughs> I'm sure that's why everyone is here, too. <laughs> so I can still be out additional drinks. Wow. <laughs> so, what you do? So I'm, 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 I'm an associate professor at Iowa State University. Um, my, my research is really in expert judgment and bias, but I do consultation work outside of that. I started a private practice after I got tenure in 2021, actually with Keith's help because I didn't know what I was doing and he knew a lot about how to start a private practice. So I'm glad he's after. So great person for advice. Um, and I've done six cases since I started that private practice, but they've been three different countries. So I've testified in uh, Canada and here in the U.S. I also had a case in Switzerland. I didn't testify there, but it was for the Court of Arbitration of Sport, which was really interesting. Um, I've been on various podcasts, also um, done engagement with media both on kind of just general forensic psych topics, so not necessarily my own work, so it kind of the field in general. There was a recent one called Unrestorable um, that was interesting. Uh, and then also I've done um, media engagement on my work, so not necessarily clinical forensic stuff, but more on expert judgment um, and bias. Um, and, oh, I also wanted to say that I did a, I did a forensic clinical postdoc before I kind of was on my academic um, tenure track stuff. So. And I did a lot of clinical forensic evaluations then. And when I started the private practice, I thought I would be doing clinical forensic work. Um, but mostly what has come has been non clinical for, uh, forensic, non clinical referrals about expert judgment bias, much more kind of in the line of unjust work. So that's very interesting. Hello. Hello, everyone. My name is Nico Welford. I'm an associate professor of psychology, actually, also at Iowa State University, the test here. 
Um, I'm in the cognitive program and I'm part of the psychology and law concentration that we now have at Iowa State. Uh, I have consulted on a number of criminal cases, testifying on issues concerning potentially unreliable eyewitness identifications, though I'm also offering testimony in cases potentially involving Fez guilty pleas, which is actually my primary area of interest for research. Um, I have done a couple of podcasts, but my primary outreach to the general public is actually through a Psychology Today blog called The Injustice System. Don't check it. I haven't updated it recently. <laughs> um, you target one, one per month. I've been slipping on that a little bit. Um, I think it's poetic that we're starting this whole session with the careers that led us to this moment that I'm instantly regretting. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, I'm also part of the Plea Bargaining Institute, which was founded by Lucian Durbin, which is aimed at trying to get plea bargaining reform. He's worked with a lot of great organizations, including Fair and Just Prosecution, who I've gotten to speak with and consult with. I'm also a member of OSAC, which is another thing that Jeff got me to do. So... Um, I think he owes me a drink after this, is what I'm hearing, actually, so, about it. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, and so for for each question, I will point it to one person in particular to, to get us started. Uh, but then after that, a couple of more people will chime in um, until, the, uh, until we get through these eight wings, eight progressively spicier sauces. Each time we'll eat it, feel free to share your reactions with them. The first one, level one, should be fairly mild. So let's just go ahead and dip and let's get to this. My eyes are eight. <laughs> Tess, I will be throwing the first question to you to start with while you can actually speak. Happy <laughs> like how right? The, the first question is more about in general getting started. Um, and, and Tess, from, from your experience and what you've heard from other people, how much of getting involved in expert work would you say is more about just the circumstance of somebody inviting you or having the opportunity versus you actively putting yourself out there? And if, if it's more about putting yourself out there, like how does someone get their foot in the door to doing expert work? Yeah, so if, you, if, if you've already been out there doing things, then things probably will come your way and you don't have to work so hard for them. But if you're just getting started, um, I was advised and I did uh, send my CV out. So when you move somewhere, someplace new or if you're just getting started, send your CV to the local attorney's office, prosecutors, um, public defenders, the local state ethics board with your name, kind of an introduction and the kinds of cases you're interested in doing with your CV. Um, and it's not going to be long before you start hearing uh, from people who are interested. Another idea, um, something that I've done before is, especially when I've moved, like I just recently did, I just recently moved to Iowa and reached out pretty quickly to like the, the state licensing board for um, attorneys and ethics boards and the local prosecutor's office and the uh, public defender's office with op uh, an offer to do a CLE, like a free training. Um, and that works really well. Um, and then also, I wanted to say, if you don't know how to set your rate, um, I wanted to know that when I was starting a private practice. So we wrote a paper, um, which is up here if anybody wants to see it. It's on um, kind of the average rate that people tend to set, their hourly rate. Um, turns out men tend to set their rate higher than women. Surprise, surprise. Um, but also, if you want to know what the actual rate people tend to set and what the standard deviation is and, and whatnot, you can check out that paper. It's also open access. It's free. You can email me. I'll, I'll send it to you also. Um, and then last but not least, talk to Heath about setting up a private practice. <laughs> yeah. Um, April. I think I'll echo what, what Tess said. Uh, for a lot of us, we also are invested in community engaged scholarship. Um, so thinking about opportunities within your community to be seen and heard. Um, so a lot of communities have different nonprofits that you might want to become a part of. So I was a non, uh, part of a board member for several nonprofits. The Colorado Juvenile Defender Center. Um, they needed some help in legislative testimony. Uh, so working with them to get the word out about all of our research pertaining to youth in the criminal legal system. Um, also kind of thinking about uh, other opportunities within community organizing spaces. Um, again, they're looking for experts who have things to say about the research that can help support some of the work that they're doing. Uh, so for each and every one of you, just thinking about how you're embedding yourself within um, community spaces in order to disseminate our knowledge and scholarship. Um, yeah, I'll stop there. 
Yeah, I, both great, obviously, recommendations. Um, I don't have a whole lot to add, but reaching out to people being proactive is definitely helpful. Um, to the list that Tess and April gave, I'll also add reaching out to local journalists, right? Journalists who cover criminal justice issues, reaching out to local innocence organizations, just putting yourself out there, putting yourself on people's radar. Um, as many of you probably know, a lot of us are very active on social media, which is a nice way to connect with people as well and make yourself more visible. Um, and the one thing I'll add is, as I mentioned a little while ago, um, I've testified quite a number of times in front of the Maryland General Assembly because I saw a bill um, that would benefit from scientific input, right? A bill about juvenile interrogations or a bill about compensating wrongly convicted people or, or things of that you know, sort. Um, I did not know this when I started doing that, but anyone can testify in favor of those bills, right? All you have to do is sign up and they will give you one or two minutes and you can go in there and speak in front of the, the Senate, right? It's a democratic process um, where you can actually go in and give your perspective as a researcher. So the other thing I would add is keep tabs on legislation in your state, in your county, whatever it might be. And if you see a bill that you think your expertise would be suited to, sign up to testify. Email the politician who sponsored the bill. Um, or, or even if they don't respond, just show up um, and make sure that your, your voice is heard. Wonderful. All right, let's move on to wing number two. <laughs> we are going to start with Miko for this next one. Um, you know, we, we can talk about broadly how to get involved, but this is an opportunity to talk about your own personal stories of how you got involved early on. Uh, Miko, if you could tell us about one of your memorable early experiences working as an expert, how the opportunity came up, um, did it, was it ultimately a good or bad experience, and what made it that way? Microphone's going to get slippery. <laughs> um, so, <clears throat> my first time testifying as an expert in an actual trial was actually a pretrial motion that we were not expecting to be successful because although there were lots of issues with the witness identification, all of the issues were due to the context in which the crime occurred. The police administration the procedure was actually pretty pristine. The only issue was that the police officer who administered the lineup after the witness identified, the suspect did not ask for a confidence statement. And what was particularly problematic about this is the identifying statement was, this looks like the guy who dot, dot, dot. So most of my arguments on direct examination concerned all of the mitigating factors present during encoding of this event, right? Lots of system variables. The culprit was wearing a partial disguise. The witness was zip tied in a supine position, limiting his ability to see the culprit's face. It was a stressful situation. There was a weapon present. It was a cross race identification, et cetera, et cetera. Essentially leading to the conclusion that given all of that and the way in which this identification statement was made, I would question that this was an unequivocal identification. Then on cross-examination, the attorney started this very interesting line of questions in which she said, well, you can't really hear a photo, can you? And I said, no. And she said, you can't really smell a photo, can you? And I said, I hope not. And then eventually all this culminated in her trying to make the argument that, well, all you can really do at a photo is look at it. So isn't the visual similarity between a photo and your memory the best you're going to get? And my response was, if I asked you to identify your mother from a lineup, you wouldn't say this looks like my mother. You would say this is my mother. And that ended the cross-examination fairly quickly. <laughs> um, and then a few weeks later, we actually found out the judge released his opinion and granted our motion to suppress the identification. A few days later, the Commonwealth dropped the charges. But the best part of this whole experience was the defense attorney reached out to me after she met with her client to inform him that the charges had been dropped. And his response was, yeah, I like when your expert talked about the attorney's mama. I thought that was really good. <laughs> yeah, Heath, how, how, was, how was yours, your first time? Uh, so this wasn't my first time testifying. It was my first time testifying in front of supervisees. And so uh, two postdocs um, who wanted to get experience observing expert testimony, this was uh, me giving an opinion about competency and civil commitment related to that. It was also one of the first remote testimony experiences I had. This was at the onset of COVID and 
and everybody was still getting used to that technology. Um, so I was a little nervous, you know, just wanting to do a good example and make sure I didn't mess up uh, the technology. And it was going swimmingly at first. Um, I got qualified as an expert, no problem. The direct examination was pretty unremarkable. And then I get into cross and I, you know, I, I get a challenging question. It was a good question. I'm trying to come up with a thoughtful answer. And, um, and then my neighbors start to make noise. And <clears throat> I'll be thoughtful of the audience. The type of noise that the neighbors was making suggested they had a very um, passionate relationship. <laughs> there was a lot of explicit instructions. And, uh, <laughs> colorful monikers and it was loud <laughs> and uh and so a few things are going on in that moment i'm like okay i have to keep a poker face and i have to hope that they're not hearing this i have to make sure that i continue to answer a fairly uh, complex question in a satisfying way and then i had to do that for 45 minutes because that's how long it took them to take lunch and uh and so by the end of it, I debriefed, and fortunately it doesn't, uh, doesn't seem that anybody had heard anything, but I learned a few things from it, which was never underestimate the power of noise canceling earphones and mics, and uh, a good poker face goes a long way, and um, kind of more in general, I, you just never know what kind of curveballs you're going to get when you're doing this kind of work, and being quick on your feet and dynamic and being able to focus despite distractions, whatever may, they may be, uh, can be very helpful. And then April. Yeah, this child's play, no big deal. <laughs> and then my story is more about how I got involved in legislative testimony. So I had moved to Colorado and I was tasked uh, with creating a advocacy and public policy course. I had actually met with one of our alumni who uh, said this was one of the things that was missing from our curriculum and our program. And so we were having a chat and at, at the end I said, I'm new to Colorado. What issues do I need to be aware about regarding public policy? And he said, you know they're still practicing conversion therapy here, right? Um, and again, for people in the audience who don't know, conversion therapy is the unfounded, unethical practice of trying to change a person's sexual orientation or gender identity. Uh, and I said, you know, we covered that for two minutes in grad school ethics class. You don't do conversion therapy, you don't do rebirthing. Um, but, <laughs> so I, I said, what, what can I do to help? Uh, and he said, you can come to the Capitol next week and testify on the bill. Uh, and as you can see from this panel, I have trouble saying no to things. <laughs> so I said, okay, I'll be there. And I had no clue what that meant uh, because we didn't have education and training on legislative testimony in our grad school programs. Uh, so I had to do my own research. I had to figure out uh, the Capitol was only 10 minutes away. You pass by it all the time, so I knew it was located. But having to learn, like what Jeff said earlier, uh, what the committee structure is like. So going back to our uh, schoolhouse rock and kind of learning all the basic <laughs> civics that we forgot, and again, in the State General Assembly, you have three minutes, three minutes to talk about what our field and what our profession and science says about a particular topic. So I was there and I testified um, on that bill a week later. It didn't successfully pass that year. Uh, went back the following year, it didn't successfully pass that year. So again, working with grassroots activists, working with nonprofits on taking this to the municipal level. Uh, so we had the city of Wheat Ridge ban the bill after more testimony. We had the city of Denver ban the bill, uh, or ban the uh, conversion therapy after we testified. And then finally, in year five, we got uh, conversion therapy banned in the state of Colorado. Uh, so again, thinking about where are places that you can get tapped in, how aware of you, are you of different bills that are entering your systems right now, you have to build this awareness. I think we all know the current sociopolitical climate right now. Uh, people are making decisions for us without us. Um, and that's you as people who are members of your community, but also in our profession as well. Um, so for me, I started committing myself three minutes of my time. I can go do this. Um, so doing other bills, I did a TED Talk in 2018, uh, reflecting on my work with adolescents who sexually offended and talked about the importance of comprehensive sex education, uh, con uh, consent education. And in that 5,000 person audience was the ACLU of Colorado, was Planned Parenthood. They stopped me afterwards and they said, hey, we're entering a bill on comprehensive sex ed that passed in 2019 um, or thereafter. So thinking about, 
thinking about those opportunities to plug in and again extend our science to community to have a greater impact on policy. Love hearing all these different stories of just how, how we, it, it's not a clear linear path, but something that can start here can really roll into something much more monumental here. Um, and I'm sure we'll get into more of that in a little bit. Now let's get into wing number three. <laughs> this picks up a bit. Well, we're going to throw this one to you, Jeff. Um, in terms of decisions, what goes into actually deciding whether or not to accept an offer to work as an expert? Um, in terms of time issues, how do you actually protect your time and balance your expert work with the full-time job that you have? The decision to whether to take an opportunity can be tricky. Um, it's not an exact science. I mean, obviously, one thing to consider is how much time it's going to take, right? Um, so having those conversations, those very sort of explicit conversations with the attorney or whomever up front about, hey, what's the timeline? How much time is this going to require of me? Um, is important so that you can sort of plan your schedule. Um, in terms of the more like ethical question of whether or not to accept a case, it gets even muddier. I mean, on the on the one hand, you know, in in my discipline in particular, your job is not to decide guilt, right? And the judge isn't going to let you decide guilt. Um, your job is to comment on the quality of the evidence or the outcome of the evaluation or, or what have you. Um, so from that perspective, you know, you're working for the science. You're not working for the client. On the other hand, there have definitely been cases where I've said, I don't think the science was good here, but I don't think my opinion is going to change the outcome of this. Right? To offer an extreme example, I once got offered a case where an attorney called me and said, um, yeah, you know, there's there's questions about the fingerprint evidence in this case. Uh, they do have my client on surveillance camera committing this murder, but um, we want you to comment on the. And I said, you know, I'm not sure this is the best use of my time, because even if I get them to throw out the fingerprint evidence, you have surveillance footage of the guy committing murder. Um, so, you know, another consideration is recognizing the boundaries of your own expertise, right? Once you put something out there, it's out there forever. And I realize that sounds scary, um, but once you testify, that transcript is, is out there, right? And future attorneys could potentially cross-examine you about things you said previously. Um, so you have to sort of make sure that you don't step too far outside of your comfort zone. Um, again, personal example, I once got offered to work on a case and I still don't know what it was about. Um, but it had something to do with cryptocurrency. That's all I remember. And they wanted me to comment on bias in the digital detection of like illegal cryptocurrency trading. And I was like, look, I don't know my Bitcoins from my other things. Like, I, I don't think I'm qualified to do this. Um, and it's like, like, I'm glad I didn't because I might have very well said something stupid or unfounded on the record. And then that could haunt me for, for quite a while. Um, so it's you know there are definitely a lot of things to to consider, um, but those are you know those are some of mine. We did not advise us not to step outside our comfort zone before asking us. To be <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he, from the more uh, from a more clinical side, what, what goes into accepting accepting cases? Uh, I think a lot of what Jeff said, I'll, I'll echo. I mean, I kind of consider three things. Um, the first is competency. Is it something I feel comfortable doing, or I feel is within my grasp? The second is time. Do I have the time to do it? How much time is it going to take? And then the third are potential disadvantages. That includes ethical quandaries, flags. Does the attorney not know what they're talking about? They have a reputation being difficult. Um, you know, social implications. I've been asked to do some high profile uh, cases before and, and turn them down because I anticipated it would have some degree of uh, public attention, and I didn't want to invite that into my world. Um, in terms of balancing the sort of work life with other responsibilities, you know, I, I hear a lot of people talk about this, and to me it's less about logistics, it's more about your philosophy. And so, you know, sort of first recognizing, uh, having the wisdom to acknowledge you, you can't do it all, and that's okay, well, unless, you're, unless you're April. Um, and 
and that um, scope. You know, what are your professional goals and what aren't your professional goals? You know, so like Dan Murray has a great research career and has a wonderful collection of plaid blazers and I only want one of those things. <laughs> and, and also thinking about your, your personal goals. And I think if you have a clear vision of what you want your personal goals to be, whether it's I want to be a present uh, parent, I want to be fit, I want to be able to enjoy one weekend a, you know, a month, um, and once you have an idea for that, I think it becomes easier to make yourself make time for it. Um, and then, you know, it sounds like a simple thing, but I think just, you know, being able to say no and doing that in a way that doesn't burn bridges. Like, I'd like to help you. I can't right now. I think it'd be great to work together in the future. Let me refer you to somebody who's good people. And in that way, you're not turning down an opportunity in sort of a long-term way, but you're protecting something that matters to you because... We have to protect against burnout um, amongst many of those other things. Uh, just a couple things to add. These are great. Um, one thing is that because my primary job is not my consulting work or my private practice, I have to be really thoughtful and careful about what the rules are for the university at which I work. There are clear rules. There's a clear number of hours that I'm allowed to do work outside of that. So I have to, I have to be thoughtful about tracking time. and. Um, it, beyond just the number of hours, like the principle is I have a job and my job takes priority over any of these consulting opportunities and I have to be very just thoughtful about that and keep that at forefront. Um, and then also um, secondarily, price, I think I use a little bit as a like, well, first of all, I look at calendar, right? And if I have time and if it's of interest and if I think I have the capacity to, to be able to answer that question, sometimes the referral question is also not clear. And so figuring out what the scope of the question is and whether I can be helpful takes more time sometimes than, um, than I expect. Uh, but beyond that, if it's something that I think is interesting, but I'm not clear I have time or I know I'm going to have to give up something on my calendar that I otherwise would be able to do, then it becomes a kind of a, a, a I tried to price myself out and that has worked. And it hasn't worked. And sometimes when it hasn't worked, then that's really interesting that people will pay what you think that they won't pay. Um, but then also because of that, I've also done pro bono work because I feel super guilty about that. Um, I'll just throw this out to anybody that wants to answer. It's something that I, I can't help but think the audience is thinking about when you're talking about this issue of, you know, am I competent in this area? We have a lot of early career people who might be having you know, some feelings of self-doubt uh, in terms of, uh, am I actually an expert in this area? Um, any, any advice on how to appropriately balance like an area of professional competency with those inner feelings where we often sell ourselves short of what we're actually capable and qualified to do? Yeah. I mean, imposter syndrome is a real thing, right? That a lot of us experience. Um, it doesn't go away. It, no, no, thank you, it does not. Um, you know, I realize this is probably easier said than done, but having a good mentor is extremely helpful. Um, having someone who's done this before who can walk you through it and who can kind of tell you, um, you know, sometimes very bluntly whether you're ready or not. Um, but that said, the reason that you're in this room is because you are ready or you will soon be because you have knowledge that other people don't have that other people could benefit from. I think there's also some under, uh, an under-recognized uh, high degree of overlap in a lot of forensic work, at least forensic clinical work, and that if you have strong kind of foundational clinical skills, that you, you can actually apply that to many different types of questions. That's not to say you're competent in all those things, but it's not going to be as difficult as you may fear to become competent. And so Jeff's point about getting a mentor, somebody who guides you along the way, if you can get them to help look at your products, do the work, do the research, um, it's not going to feel too adrift. I know when I came right out of grad school, I was very, very conservative. I would only do the things that I was trained to do and had done quite a bit. If I had just done one or two, I was like very hesitant. And I, I think that's a little bit of an overcorrection. And I think the longer you do this and the more you kind of figure out your comfort level and what things you do well and you refine and I don't want to say perfect, but get better at doing some of those things, you'll eventually become more comfortable kind of, um, pushing yourself to do other kinds of things while still doing it in an appropriate way. Hold on to that mic heat for wing number four here.
Heath, have you have you seen times where your expert work ended up informing um, your other your other practice, teaching, research, or vice versa? You know, how does your expert work require a different skill set than your primary professional role, or do the skills really overlap in a lot of ways? That wasn't too bad, Anthony. You really let me down here. <laughs> Famous last words. Yeah, I mean, you set yourself up, buddy. Um, <laughs> I'm confident. Um, I think the there's quite a bit of synergy. I think a lot of the expert work I do is um, frequently a byproduct of my sort of day job. You know, you do an evaluation and you're asked to do some kind of testimony about that. Um, you know, I kind of perceive forensic consultation as weaponized supervision, and so I'm comfortable with supervision in a constructive way. I just kind of pull back the veil on that uh, when I have to do it in that context. So a lot of similarities between the two. You know, you have to uh, know what you're doing and have good foundational knowledge. You're educating at the end of the day. And, you know, I, but the differences I think are pretty striking. You know, there's a big difference for me in writing something down, a report, a research article, and having to uh, be quick on your feet and be a good orator and explain things in a very sometimes antagonistic or contested fashion and make it make sense. Um, that's not easy to do. I think that um, the pressure and failure are different, at least for me. Um, sometimes if it's a high stakes case or it's very contentious or for whatever reason, um, you know, it feels heavier having to be the expert and if you mess it up, or you feel like you failed, and it could be something as simple as the court doesn't go your direction. We're not supposed to take that personally, but sometimes if you poured your heart into something, you can't help it. Um, and you have to kind of roll with that. I, I had a, a case, it was, um, I think this was also competency, and it was high profile, and it was very contested. And, you know, the critical issue was uh, fundamentalist beliefs versus delusional beliefs. So, yeah, yeah, right. Everybody's like, oh, that, you know, like, oh, you poor thing, yeah. So this was a brutal, brutal process. I was so proud of it. And um, getting up there and having to make sense of it in that venue kind of challenged me to, to, one, really refine my conceptualization and understanding of the material and how those concepts differ, you know, reviewing the Cunningham model and things like that. Um, it forced me to really... Um, try to articulate it in a way that wasn't too long-winded, that was succinct and clear, and utilized examples from the case. Um, and it didn't go my direction. And so it really challenged me to take that in stride and not personalize what felt like a failure in the moment. And so expert work really kind of tests your mettle in, in that sense. And Miko, and then Tess. So I think um, one of the best ways that expert work synergizes with my day job is I'm a research professor. I really like when I get ideas for new research and being involved in expert work really helps me keep a pulse on what's actually going on in the real world. I think when we're doing research in a lab, it's very easy for us, myself included, to just get lost in the minutia of these very controlled experiments that we can conduct where we can isolate the effect of one variable and look at what effect it has in this very specific context. And then you consult on a real case and you go, wow, this variable that I've been studying is completely irrelevant in this particular case. And I think a good example is um, lineup procedures. So we talk a lot about pristine lineup procedures and we should, they're very, very important. But that said, I've come across an increasing number of cases where pristine lineup procedures are irrelevant because of everything that happens before the witness has ever shown a lineup. And that is with the growth of social media, there are more and more cases now where witnesses investigate their own cases and they've already identified the suspect before they're presented a lineup. And then I have to come in and say, yes, I know your lineup was pristine. It doesn't matter that it was pristine because of all the suggestibility that happened before that. So I think it's really important when you're doing this kind of work to really keep an open mind and think about how is it applicable to your research and how does it show potentially weaknesses in the generalizability of your work. And I think it can really help to feed the other. With regard to overlap in skills, I think there's a really nice overlap in the skills required to be an effective expert as well as an effective academic. There's a lot of synthesis of knowledge, disseminating knowledge, being able to summarize material effectively. Um, there's maybe a little more improvisation required in expert work, particularly when you're testifying, but I think 
it's it's very complementary in a lot of ways, I think. Um, first of all, I'm proud of myself because we're four and I have not died. <laughs> um, just a little bit to add. I'm going to try not to die. My nine-year-old predicts I'm going to die. Um, but... So just did again. <laughs> I had just a couple things to add to this. Um, one, I talked a little bit about it before, about how um, this, for the wearing two hats idea. So one, I expected when I started a private practice that the, the things that were going to come calling would be clinical forensic cases, which tend to have pretty clear referral types. And so you kind of know if it's a competence question or if it's an insanity question or whatnot. And these are things I know how to do and that attorneys know how to ask for. But with, when, with my other hat, kind of more researcher hat, when attorneys come with cases, they don't really know what they're looking for, and I have to spend more time um, understanding the case, and because some of my work is on bias and trying to reduce exposure to information that's gonna influence how you, as an expert, are gonna reach your opinion, I try really hard not to get access to information about a case. That's really hard. If you don't know what the question's gonna be or how you can help, trying to figure out how to do that is really tough, and I don't know the answer to that, but I'm certainly interested in figuring it out. Um, and then as part of that, I've tried in several cases to just limit my involvement at a framework level versus um, trying to actually engage on the substance of the case. So I, this has been worked a couple times where I've said, okay, you have this question that's roughly about how bias can influence expert judgment. I can write a, a report about that in the abstract and give you a summary of the literature and then maybe that's gonna be useful to your case, and maybe I don't have to know anything about the details of your case, maybe you don't have to tell me anything about the case, so I can stay totally blind to your case, and then if and when you decide that's gonna be helpful, if you want you know, if you want me to do a second part of this, perhaps, where I apply these facts to the situation of your case, maybe I could do that, I have done that. And other times they've called me as a, a witness where I testify at that abstract framework level, and then occasionally there's been hypothetical questions where they'll, where they'll ask me hypothetically, which is similar to whatever the facts are of your case, but I don't know it necessarily. Um, and that's worked um, a couple of times. All right, halfway there. All right, let's move on to number five. I shouldn't have swallowed that one deep. <laughs> so April, um, what have you noticed helps you communicate effectively with non-experts, whether it's lawyers, politicians, journalists, um, and you, you've worked with several different types of audiences. Are, th are there any that you find particularly challenging to communicate with coming from uh, a psychology background? Yeah, I think one of the things that uh, we all have to be thinking about is, um, again, how do we get our research outside of our peer-reviewed journal articles? Uh, we, uh, we, we spend a lot of money uh, trying to get our degrees and use all these fancy terms, and now I'm going to tell you to take them all away. Uh, thinking about how are we communicating our message to the public in a way that is either informative or persuasive. Uh, so one of the things um, that I do or I teach to my students is how do we engage in some public impact scholarship? So think about your research right now. Who would you like your audience of that research to be beyond the people at this conference? Uh, so is it community members? Is it a legislator? How do we reframe it into that? So uh, when you're creating your research topic or you're creating um, your study, uh, are you planning on creating infographics? Are you uh, creating some cool uh, Anthony and then do this uh, cool like Twitter moving infographics hot tubbing stuff uh, <laughs> uh, to again engage the public yeah I thought it was some technical term uh, to engage the public in your research in some ways where they don't have to read a long boring journal article is it writing op-eds for your newspaper um, again that's a space where anybody can write an op-ed uh, one of the op-eds that I wrote didn't get much traction because Donald Trump Jr. had published one the same day, so anybody can write one. Um, and, so, and, and so that being a mechanism of communicating our work to the public. So uh, there was one example that I always bring up. Um, there was a case where a 16-year-old girl killed her 7-year-old nephew. Um, and as you looked at the information in the internet and the comment sections, just all sorts of nasty things about this young girl, and it was a racially minoritized girl. Um, again, I could walk away from that newspaper article and do nothing uh, and go about my day, 
or can I talk to the community about what it might be like for girls in the system? We know that 90% have a history of abuse. Uh, we know that our Supreme Court is uh, rethinking how we treat youth in the system. So I took the opportunity to write a 700 word op-ed to put in the newspaper to talk about her case, uh, give people a new lens on how to view the case. Again, I might not change people's opinions on this, but I'm giving them information about what's, what do we know in our field. So for us, it's really kind of thinking about how do we communicate this better to the community and to the audience that we intend for our research to um, get to and access. If it's legislators, they like to hear numbers. Uh, one of the things that I'm still bad at is what's the cost savings of this intervention because we don't talk about money a lot. But I can tell you that prevention is a lot cheaper than the criminal legal system and building prisons and jails. And so we do have some figures for that. And again, that's where I might um, earlier, uh, one of the things I might give advice on is consulting with colleagues. Uh, pick up the phone, uh, call your colleagues who have expertise uh, in, in this field and get some mentorship around maybe some of the areas that you're not familiar with. Um, that's why we have conferences like this so you can network and meet people in this room who you can rely on. Uh, so those people are the ones who might fill in the spaces when I'm talking to legislators about um, so again, for all of your research, just think about the audience you want to reach and think about ways that we can communicate it that is um, persuasive or informative uh, to them. Um, I went a little bit of a different direction than this. That was a great answer. Um, I have put the spots in translation. How do we affect the states? I testified in a case, um, I think it was last year. It was it was a case against the state. It was about racial bias in the capital punishment process. And I was testifying, the defense had called me. And the prosecution um, was trying to get me to get on the record about my own attitudes about the capital punishment, about capital punishment in general. And I tried to refuse it, and I tried to refuse it, and I tried to refuse it, and then I was ordered to answer it. And then it's on the record forever. Um, so that was fun. But um, that was not what I was going to say. That was just about, yeah, from your question earlier. Um, but I, from this case, I actually brought part of the transcript because it's totally relevant to this question. Um, the prosecutor started asking, he was trying to poke holes basically in this in the like, defense's argument that there was evidence of racial bias in the capital justice process. And he kept the prosecution, the prosecutor kept asking, well, isn't it possible that blah, 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 but, you know, with a, with a critique, isn't it possible that blah, 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 blah. But every question, it was it a was probabilistic statement asking, isn't there any probability? And the scientist in me felt like I had to say, yes, it's possible for every one of these questions. But it was a series of them. And it was so misleading in the totality, but it was true in each little piece. <laughs> and so, of course, the attorney who originally called me knew this. She was quite bright and called me on redirect. And that's how she started. Redirect was right about this issue. And so she said, I'd like to start with Questioning, uh, if you recall the state's line of questioning regarding whether something is possible, do you recall having to answer pretty frequently for, the, for some of the state's questions? I say yes, yada, 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 there's a lot more. She says, so was there really any, was there really in your eyes any other way to answer other than it's possible? I say it's my best answer. Then when we get into, we get into probabilities and why asking you a question about probabilities might carry more information, right? Something's probable or something's like, uh, possible, even at like 0.001%. But if you were to say like 70%, that's a lot more information than just it's possible. Um, but of course, these things are challenging, right? And it's not even like you're going to know the probability anyway, probably you know, for, for most things. Um, so that's challenging. I don't know how to make it better, but things get lost in translations. <laughs> I have a couple scattered thoughts on this. So uh, sort of hearkening back to the previous question. For those who are considering doing expert testimony, in my view, there actually is some overlap in skill set there. Um, giving expert testimony isn't fundamentally different from teaching for those of us who teach, right? You're trying to explain what you do and explain this novel concepts to non-experts in a way that they can understand, right? So a lot of those skills do transfer in terms of communicating effectively. Um, with respect to politics, at the risk of being overly cynical, um, you know, as April mentioned, we live in a weird socio-political climate right now. Don't assume that people share your values. Don't assume that people are going to do the right thing just because it's the right thing. Um, you know, there is an element of persuasion there where you have to convince them that doing this is not just the right thing, but it's in your best interest too, right? So there's definitely an element of framing. Like if I'm in a room of Democrats versus Republicans, I'm going to focus, or, or even defense attorneys versus prosecutors, 
I'm going to focus on social justice with one group, and I'm going to focus on, well, you know, if we get the wrong guy, the real perpetrator is free to reoffend with the other group, right? So you can, you know, you can tailor that message to, to sort of suit what their needs are or what their goals are. Um, with respect to journalists, you do have to be careful because as we probably know, the media likes to, they like their clickbait, they like to sensationalize things and oversimplify things. So you do have to make sure that they're like faithfully transmitting what you're telling them. At the same time, you don't want to provide so much detail that it, people just gloss over it and it goes over their heads, right? So there, there is a delicate balance there in terms of communicating science to the public. And then the last thing I'll say is when you're working with people from another discipline, but you're working toward a common goal, right? Like in OSAC, in my experience, for example, where I'm working with forensic practitioners, but we're trying together to improve forensic science. You have to listen as much as you talk, right? You learn from them, they learn from you. You're gonna have tough conversations. You may not get along at times, but at the end of the day, you have to work together, right? You have to understand that sometimes your idealism is too ideal. Sometimes their resistance is too resistant. There is a happy medium, but you have to work together to find it. Very quickly, I meant to say this earlier and you made me think about it. Journalists have a code of ethics that is not what you might expect. Um, well, maybe, I mean, it's a great code of ethics and it's good, but that means that you're not going to get the last word in what they say and you may not even know what they're going to say. In fact, in fact, you probably will not know what they're going to say or how they're going to quote you and how it's going to look like what you said maybe isn't what you said. And that's that's out of your control. I didn't understand that when I first was doing it. And I thought like, no, I should get, you know, I should get to, for scientific credibility, you know, I should be able to give you feedback. No, that's not how it works. Um, and it's and it's against their ethics for it to work like that. So they're supposed to have the last word. Um, so it's worth doing, but just understand that you're taking, you take a risk if you engage in that kind of product. Yeah, and of course, regardless of what content is in that article too, even less control over the, the headline that frames the entire message that you have in there that grabs whatever audience looks at the headline to decide whether they're going to even read what you have to say at all. Um, all right, let's get to wing number six. getting bad. All right, so th this one goes to heat. All right, what's something ple unpleasant uh, that people should know about before they dive into expert work, um, particularly any ethical or practical challenges you face and how you navigate it? Um, as a heads up, Jeff, you're going to have to answer this too, and in the lines of challenges, you need to respond in a haiku. <laughs> I'm definitely changing my answer now. I think something that we never talk about, nobody's ever talked to me about this, about challenges of doing this kind of work. And probably the most challenging and in some ways common issue I've come up with is navigating ethically questionable conduct by other forensic colleagues. Um, I had a, an instant, well, there we go. <laughs> Out of curiosity, show of hands, how many people in here have encountered a situation where a colleague in the field was doing something that was ethically probably pretty questionable. Yeah. Thanks. All right. How many of you have had a training on it? There we go. So, see you next year. So um, uh, I, I, was, I was doing a case, and it was a, a battle of the experts kind of thing. And um, you know, first evaluator was uh, court-ordered evaluation, worked for a state facility, you know, went up there, uh, did their thing, and then it, got off the stand, and when I went up there to do direct and then cross, um, instead of setting in the back pew, you know, where you know, all the audience members stay, they sat at the prosecutor's table, and they gave them notes. I could see them looking at the notes before they would cross me, and I found out later that they were giving them research articles to help undermine the credibility of my opinion. Um, and so, you know, in that instance, you know, the way I handled it was, you know, first I stayed professional. You know, I did not bring up this concern or um, criticize their professionalism on the stand. That wasn't the point. 
you know, we always talk about consulting. I consulted with a colleague and and kind of reflected on what is my professional obligation in this situation. Um, you know, we clearly have in our code of conduct and specialty guidelines an obligation to sort of monitor the field and do something about it. But you know, when do we have a specific duty? You know, when is it my problem or your problem um, versus the next person's problem? And, and, and how do we make those decisions? What factors do we consider? What biases do we try to control for? How does politics play into it? How is our relationship with the person paying into it? So how to consider all these things. Uh, ultimately decided that it was poor judgment, but not unethical. And I decided not to informally discuss it with the person because I, you know, I didn't really know them that well. It didn't seem like my place. But it impressed upon me just how much um, of an issue I think this really is and how little guidance we really have on it. And it's something that I continue to sort of belabor and try to make sense of. Uh, so that's not really a positive message. I'm really interested in Jeff's <laughs> As expert witness, unpredictable timeline can be frustrating. <laughs> so, no, but in all seriousness, I, that was one of the things that came as the biggest, I think, surprise to me when I started doing more of this work was sometimes you will talk to an attorney, they will offer you to work on a case, and you'll say, great, when do you need a report? And they're like, I don't know. And they'll say, when's the hearing going to be? And like, I don't know. It's like, how do I plan for that? Right? But they sincerely don't know because they're trying to hit a moving target just like everyone else. There have been multiple times. I'm actually testifying in a case down in Georgia next week. This is the third time that the hearing has been rescheduled. Right? The first two times I had a plane ticket. I was like, here we go. I'm going to Georgia. And I got a call at the last minute. Hearing got rescheduled. Motion got denied. Whatever. Things can change at the last minute. And you sort of have to be prepared to adapt on the fly. Um, so, you know, again, it kind of goes back to what I said before, needing to set clear expectations with an attorney up front. I think having a good first experience is really, really helpful um, in terms of an attorney who's willing to work with, work with you through your first case, having a mentor who's willing to work with you through your first case. Make sure that you have a good first experience to, to build off of. Um, and also someone who's willing to prep you pretty hard um, you know, you don't want to go in unprepared. They can do things like mock, mock cross, mock trials, and, 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 and so on. Um, the reason that's important is because you can't, as an expert witness, answer a question that the attorney didn't ask, right? And that's, I've been frustrated by that as well, where I'm sitting on the stand, I'm like, why haven't you asked me about this other thing that I really want to talk about, right? And, and unfortunately, you can't just start talking about whatever you feel like. Um, the same goes for redirect, right? If something comes up on cross, you want an attorney who can pick up on that and give you the opportunity to, to refute it. Um, so, you know, being clear up front, whether it's when you first take the case before you testify about what your expectations are, what the timeline is, what questions do you want to be asked, maybe what questions do you not want to be asked, um, so that you know exactly what you're getting yourself into. I'm going to be quick because I think we're running out of time. So I would just piggyback on what Jeff said with regard to just accepting that you have little to no control over how a case unfurls. So I've also had multiple instances where I was ready to testify, prepared myself, reviewed all the notes, and then one of the witnesses whose testimony I need to see doesn't show up. So we get a continuance, and then there's another continuance. And by the time the case is actually heard, you have reviewed these materials half a dozen times, ready to testify. So I think you just have to accept, if you're going to do this work, that you are going to have little to no control over how the case progresses and really over the outcome as well, right? We serve a very narrow function in the entirety of a case. And yes, it's hard to not maybe take it personally if you feel like a case should have gone a particular way, but you have a very limited role in how a case tends to play out. So I think accepting that you have very little control over this process, which I think is probably one of the biggest asymmetries, because I agree with Jeff, there's a lot of overlapping skills, but we're also kind of spoiled in academia in a lot of ways. We get to control a lot of things, right? Like some of you came to this conference and said, I'm just gonna cancel class because I need to go to a conference, right? We have lots of control over how a class functions, over the direction of a paper, program of research, all these things. This is an arena where you will have little to no control. So you just need to be prepared for that. We are now at 
the chef reaction sauce. <laughs> So April, what's uh, what's the best? <laughs> other than not to do a chicken wing um, panel, panel like this? What's the best piece of advice you've gotten about working as an expert that you're really thankful you got? Um, for me, again, a, a lot of my identity is as a scholar activist. Yep, and it's building. <laughs> <laughs> so the best le lessons that I've learned have been from community members, actually. So now the um, ones come out. <laughs> <laughs> so most of the lessons I've learned have been from community members and have been from people outside our profession. Um, so I think too much we're siloed um, in psychology that we're not talking to other people in philosophy and social work, um, abolitionists um, and people who are community organizers. Uh, we need to listen to those voices too. Um, a workshop that I went to this week. Yep, it off. Ooh. <laughs> a workshop I went to this week talked about the use of evidence in policy making. And we were having this back and forth conversation about research evidence versus other forms of evidence in those forms of evidence being just as valid. Uh, so whether that's uh, lived experience, and again, that's being a weird definition, uh, whether that's being uh, narratives that people might have, all of that is valuable in our work and in policy making, and also in our research, uh, that still we over value qualitative, or quantitative research and sometimes diminish community-oriented uh, research, diminish qualitative research. So we need to get out of those silos and really focus on what the community is saying about the issues that are happening to us and making sure that they have a seat at this table as well. Not this table, but we'll try to form cool tables. Tess, go for it. Jeez. So, <laughs> I had a, in graduate school, my doctoral mentor, his name is Stan Brodsky. I went to the University of Alabama, worked with him there, and he did a lot of work on um, this issue about um, helping expert witnesses, uh, expert witness. So he wrote some books, one is called The Expert Expert Witness. I have a picture of it here. I have some excerpts if anybody wants to check it out. They're really good books. They have little kind of maxims and tips um, for testifying, but one stuck with me forever. Um, and I, I think it, it, it's meaningful and it, I think it was counterintuitive and it's about authenticity. Um, so there's a quote from one of the books that says, authenticity is about who you are as a scientist or a professional. The overriding rule is to seek ways to present you at your natural and genuine best. So I clearly remember him saying, even, even be authentic in how you dress. So don't show up at court in clothes that are, you know, they look proper and formal or whatever, but you're super uncomfortable, you can't breathe or you can't move and you're gonna be anxious in them. Dress nicely, professionally, but in a way that you, you ordinarily would anyway, so you feel more authentically yourself and you will be better able to do whatever it is that comes your way if you feel more authentically yourself. So that one, those are words of wisdom that have stayed with me. So in, in preparation for today, um, when, when we were writing these questions, I emailed a large handful of ECPs who are also friends of mine. And I asked them, you know, what would you want to get out of a session like this? Um, and like, what are your questions? What are your concerns about doing this kind of work? And one of the most common reactions from them, I'm very grateful to that, by the way, those of you who are here, I'm looking at some of you right now. Um, one of the most common concerns was, I, they didn't say it this way, but I'm worried about getting cross-examined, right? I'm worried about what is the prosecutor gonna ask me? Are they, what if they make me say something stupid? What if they ask a question that I don't know the answer to, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I was worried about that too when I first started. And I got a very good piece of advice. Um, I don't remember regrettably who gave it to me. It might've been my friend Jennifer Friedman over here. I don't remember. 
Um, but their piece of advice was, look, you teach all the time. Surely students come to class and don't do the reading and ask you dumb questions. <laughs> respond to the prosecutor in the same way that you would respond to them, <laughs> right? You need to be respectful, you need to be polite, but you need to explain to them calmly why they're wrong. <laughs> and that has been extremely helpful. Again, it speaks to the overlap between the skills you need to teach and the skills you need to testify. Um, so in conclusion, I want it on the record that I am tougher than chat. Thank you very much. <laughs> I only heard about 25% of that. I'm sure it's great. Uh, we, will, we will wrap up with the final question and the final one. Uh, make sure you put a little bit of extra on this one. It is the last dab. And we'll throw it over to Miko to start this one. What is the most rewarding aspect of, of expert work? That's what you really watch now. Go. You're welcome. Not this. <laughs> so I have actually not had the opportunity to testify in front of a jury yet, but I have been able to testify in two motions to suppress before very open-minded judges, and there's something very rewarding about having the opportunity to explain to a judge why evidence that they might have seen is, you know, valid and something that obviously should be presented to a jury and convincing them that no, this evidence in this case is actually gonna be more prejudicial than diagnostic. And to get the opinion where they actually agree with you and they cite your research in supporting that opinion or the research that you cited, that's a really rewarding experience. And then in addition, I had the opportunity to actually, and I'll dovetail this in the previous question, one of my biggest pieces of advice for people would be not only to find a mentor that you trust if you're interested in doing expert work, but to actually shadow someone on a case so you can really fully see how they engage this process. And Nancy Franklin was very helpful to me when I was getting started. She was nice enough to let me shadow her on a case that she was actually getting uh, support through the Boston College Innocence Project, where there was a man who had been wrongfully convicted of first degree murder based largely on the alleged identifications of three eyewitnesses. We got to work on the report together, submitted it to a judge, and ultimately the judge cited this report numerous times in his decision to overturn the conviction. And now, thanks in part to contributions that I was able to make in that case, Milton Jones is now on the National Registry of Exonerations, is fully exonerated, now can try to sue for compensation in that case. It's hard to get more rewarding than that. We can pass that over to he. I think we should start incorporating this, this hot ones wings thing to board certification with the, the oral defense. Yeah. It really keeps us on our toes. Um, you know, this kind of work I think presents a great opportunity to, to educate in a different kind of way. It's a totally different medium. And sometimes I think it can be more effective. I think it can be more rewarding. Um, you know, I mentioned earlier with some of my examples that it really kind of presses you to refine your conceptualization, how well you know something, how well you can talk about it. Um, it's an opportunity to get feedback as well. Um, after Every time I testify, I, I try to get feedback from the attorney. I was like, I'm trying to get better at this as I go. You know, how can I be better? Uh, things like that. I think it also um, feeds my narcissism. And <laughs> it's a delicate thing in this field. You either have way too much of it or not enough. And so, you know, I'd like to think that it, it helps me kind of strike a balance and, and it introduces a little bit of humility uh, as well, which hopefully I've already demonstrated, but I think, <laughs> I think those are the payoffs at the very least for me. And before we throw it to the audience, April, if you have any great thoughts here. Did you know your ears can sweat? <laughs> <laughs> my, my presentation later today is on reparations. I will now talk about how Jeff and Anthony owe me reparations. <laughs> Uh, for me, it's uh, it's the wins and measuring success. Uh, so I know from the panelists that you heard from today, just thinking about the successes they gave from seeing people exonerated, 
uh, from being able to change laws and policies. Um, again, I know things are often dark for us right now, and we feel that we don't have a lot of power, but we do. Um, and again, thinking about collective action and that the importance of engaging in collective action and thinking about how we transform our research into that action is what keeps me going and uh, where I see the benefits of this work, uh, that we can do this together and kind of thinking about the different ways that we can um, really get our research out there into the public to make a change is where I hope to see the bill go. And again, students and trainees, um, you're doing this. Um, but a lot of you are coming to grad school now, seeing all the injustices that we've experienced over the last few years, wanting to do better. Um, so this is the time to do that. And uh, again, I hope you have people to help you do that. I know several of us on this panel are first generation college students. And so uh, thinking about uh, what that looks like for us to now be able to set the tone for the next generation. Well, I know the, the, everybody here is really appreciating everybody's perspective here. Um, I want to make sure that we open it for your questions. We have about 10 minutes for questions, if anybody has any. Uh, so when I've testified, the on cross the issue always comes up. I'm being paid a lot for me with him. And I'm pretty sure that's true, no matter what your field has done. Some experts have told me, just acknowledge it with a brief answer, give them nowhere to go. Others have sort of said, like, they come back at them, if like, how do you get paid sort of thing? So I guess my question is, uh, when they're coming at you with sort of bad ominous attacks, like, exactly what level of sassiness should I respond to? <laughs> <laughs> any, any thoughts? Yeah. Thoughts? Okay. I mean, for, for me, the payment thing is a lazy question. It's, it's, it's low-hanging fruit. Every prosecutor, 80% of prosecutors will ask it, just to have it on the record. Um, this is, I think, where it's helpful to have a savvy defense attorney who can counter that on redirect. Um, something I'll do on occasion is, uh, if they ask that question on cross, on redirect, I'll have the, uh, uh, the defense attorney ask me about opportunities that I declined. Right, to make it clear that I'm not just a hired gun who accepts every case that comes across my desk. That I am somebody who vets these cases, and the reason that I am here, yes, I'm being paid, but the reason I'm here is because I've looked at these issues, and unlike in other cases, I thought that my assistance was needed. Um, so, you know, you don't want to give the impression that you're just there for the money. Of course, none of us are, um, but it's, you know, it's a, it's a lazy question. I am. Um... I think in depositions, it, it's sometimes a little more, I know, I know people do depositions and they get really starch. Um, but, you know, my approach, we were talking about advice about testimony earlier and Rick Demir once said to me, he's like, you know, it's pretty simple. He's like, just be transparent, be honest, and uh, don't be defensive. And I, you know, we focus so much on content and answering the answers correctly. Uh, we don't want to lose sight of the fact that they, we still want them to see us as approachable and non-defensive. And, and the judges are not idiots. They're going to know if an attorney is being antagonistic or going for low-hanging fruit. And it sometimes, I think, can actually work in your favor if you demonstrate composure in, in the way of an opportunity to not do that. And it is tempting, particularly if, if somebody's really kind of going out of their way to make really unfair digs. But I, I feel that I come out of it feeling better, and I think sometimes it's more effective for my point if I can sort of take the higher ground, so to speak. One other thought is maybe don't change your rate for testimony. I think maybe just have an hourly rate and however long it takes you to be there in court and wait around to testify or whatever. If it's the same rate, then it's just your hourly rate. It is what it is. Okay. Any questions from the side of the I have a question. My name is Cassandra Bailey. Um, I wanted to know how you all prepare for testimony on a clinical phase versus if it's different from preparing like on a research-based case? So I can talk about the research-based cases. So usually how I prepare is um, I usually think about direct examination questions that I think are particularly pertinent to the case, facts that we definitely want to address on direct. And then I usually request that the attorney do a full practice direct examination with me and then in addition do at least one or two cross-examinations with me as well. I've also found it helpful to ask them to have a colleague do a practice cross-examination because of course, 
they've spent time with the case. They have their own opinions regarding things. They're not gonna approach the case in the same way as someone who maybe has spent less time with it and doesn't know the client. So, um, so I think that was really important for me, particularly when I was starting out and was nervous about the prospect of being cross-examined to do actual practice run-throughs and to make sure as much as possible that you're on the same page as the defense attorney with regard to what you can offer in that case specifically. Could you maybe just talk a little bit about confidentiality issues as you either prepare the re reports or start working on a case, discussing it with fellow colleagues? What can you say? What can't you say? It's a I have just uh, a quick thought that I learned from Heath. Because um, because my primary work is at the university and my private practice is separate from that, I'd be careful about even just documents for confidentiality of documents. So not all of that is stored separate. So I have to pay separately for HIPAA compliant storage solutions and Keith advised me on all of that. Um, which, I mean, it takes some thought, right? It takes some thought to be, be careful about those sorts of things. But also then just when a case is ongoing or even after it's done, I don't always know where those lines are of what's permissible to talk about and when I'm teaching, sometimes I want to talk about case examples, and I do sometimes t talk about them, and I try and, you know, not give a lot of details, and uh, or if it is done, like this one that I quoted from, that's done, and it's a public document, so that one I can talk about. Um, but that's that's a that's a hard question. I don't know if other people have advice, and we hear your advice too. So um, a lot of these rules, too, can differ by jurisdiction. So often if I have doubts, I will just ask the defense attorney directly. Like, you know, I have a colleague in this area. Would it be okay for me to discuss this case, giving these types of details? Um, I found that just a really good way to be very cautious. Because, for instance, when I took cases in Massachusetts, I could actually talk about the content in police reports because police reports are public record in most jurisdictions in Massachusetts. So it really depends, it can be very jurisdiction specific. So particularly if you're doing consulting nationwide, it's gonna be very hard for you to know what the rules are everywhere. So I think it's perfectly acceptable to just ask the defense attorney and say, what am I allowed to talk about in this case for the following reasons? Um, I would also just mention, kind of similar to what Tess was saying, that one of the best pieces of advice that Nancy gave me was actually always being mindful of what in your communications might be discoverable either during the um, trial process or even on post-conviction. So when you email defense attorneys, be very thoughtful as to how friendly you sound, how familiar you sound, because um, prosecutors, or if you're working on the defense side, right, they're gonna try and say you're biased toward one side or the other. So if you sound really friendly with attorneys and emails, that could potentially be problematic if those emails are discoverable. So this is another thing you should always be mindful of, is whether your communications are fully confidential or whether they could be discoverable. I think it's also important to be mindful of when you're consulting. And so if you're, for instance, consulting before you've written a report, that's a different animal, right? And I mean, I even have like a clause in my consent, well, not cons well yeah, consent is um, my fee agreements that kind of mention I can consult with colleagues about matters while protecting the details. In terms of the disclosure, um, you know, it could be tempting to kind of paint a full case conceptualization of somebody. We're kind of trained to do that clinically. Um, I try to really narrow the scope to the issue that I'm struggling with and give them just the details they need. Be more mindful about it if it's a well-known or high-profile case, whether nationally or locally, and keeping that in mind with who you're talking to and do my best to protect it. Well, we really hope this panel has helped you think about where you can impact with your expertise, how you can do that, and at the core of it, why you should or why you would want to do that. Um, so thank you so much for our hopefully not too regretful uh, experts on this panel.